All right, 2 Timothy chapter number 3. Now, we left off here this morning with uh, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, denying the power thereof. From such, he says, turn away. I gave you the passages on that, the things that you need to know in reference to turning away. Not argue with, not fuss with, not try to convert. Stay away from them. Turn away from them. Leave them alone. Uh, it's interesting to me that the Lord has that approach, but the approach is, is that if they don't want it, you can't help them. Right. Now, let me just give you something here for you to consider. Even when it comes to spiritual things, if an individual doesn't want help, you can't help them. Amen. Spirituality is not something you can force upon somebody. It is something that you have to allow them to say, I need some help. If they don't, you know what you have to learn to do? You have to learn to wait for the Holy Spirit to open up the door and give you that opportunity. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. Amen. One of the greatest time wasters is, is for you to spend time, and a lot of times it's with family members. I'm by no means saying give up on your family, give up on the prodigals, and don't have anything to do with them. But spend your time talking to the Lord about them instead of spending your breath talking to them. Right. Uh, what you can do is make the position adversarial. You can wind up arguing and fussing and fighting with them because you're trying to convince them. And then it becomes a point of contention to you trying to win an argument instead of let the Lord work. I know you mean well. I know you intend to do well. But there's too many verses in the Bible where the Lord continually and consistently cautions you about not getting entangled with individuals. The Lord doesn't even spend time arguing with Pharisees. As a matter of fact, He is a master at ducking an argument argument. Uh, he is an individual that can come in and within a matter of few words, he's done with it and moving along to somebody else. Uh, one preacher likened it unto being a good linebacker. He said, what you have to learn to do is don't get tangled up in the block. What that means is, especially if you're playing the outside linebacker position is, is when that pulling guard comes at you, you want to get tangled up with him because you're frustrating that he's trying to knock you on your can. But if you get tangled up with the block, he's done his job and by that time the play's already passed you. What you have to learn to do is, is to shuck that block off so you can make the play. Well, a lot of times what you may not recognize is, is you think you're contending for the Lord and all it is is the devil just sending a pull and guard your way and you're tied up with the guard while the play runs on by you. He doesn't care. You've already missed the opportunity. There's a great illustration of that over in the Old Testament where Abraham is over here and he's having a discussion there with Lot and they're talking about where they're going to get the property and all this stuff and, and uh, Lot looks out there and he sees the plains are well watered and he said, boy, I can make me some fat slick cows if I put them in that pasture over there. And Abraham has the sense to recognize perceptively he sees that the heathen are watching them. And he says, uh, hey, listen here, uh, nephew, we shouldn't be arguing in front of this bunch of heathen people. You go ahead and decide what you want to get because what is he doing? He's shucking off the block so that he can make the play. He's recognizing the heathen people are watching these two people that are supposed to be being blessed by God while they're arguing over a land grant. They're arguing over material possessions. Abraham backs off that thing. You know what he's willing to do? He's letting a guy that doesn't know half of what he knows about raising animals, half of what he knows about land, half of what he knows about being granted the blessings that came from God. Remember, Abraham's the guy that was God's friend. Remember that? And the Lord comes down there and Abraham looks around. And he recognizes the company he's in. And he says, you go ahead and pick. I'll take whatever's left over. Now, what I'm trying to show you is, is that oftentimes when it comes to an argument, I'm not saying compromise. I'm not saying back off. I'm not saying be a, a, a pipsqueak about your faith, but pick your battles. Make sure before you plant your flag and you're ready to die on the hill that it's worth dying for. Any of you have ever looked much into the Vietnam War, the Vietnam uh, 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 policing action, whatever you want to call it. It was a war if there ever was a war. But if you look at certain things, they have a thing up there called Hamburger Hill. And that got its name because they would go up and take the hill and then the upper echelon would say, come off the hill and give the Viet Cong back the hill. And then they would go back up the hill and take the hill at great cost, great uh, uh, a, a danger, great uh, loss of uh, lives to take it over. That's why they would run them down like hamburger. They would just chew them up and spit them out and they'd finally eventually take the, the, the land up there and instead of holding the land, they'd come off the land. As soon as you came off the land, they'd take it. It was called Hamburger Hill. Well, ladies and gentlemen, some hills ain't worth dying for. Amen. Amen. 
The illustration is, is that all you're doing is getting chewed up and spit out, but you haven't gained anything once you got there. So, you know, the Lord tries to give you the, uh, the, the liberty to understand that you don't have to argue about everything. And you don't have to win every argument. Sometimes you can lose an argument and come out to be the winner. You don't have to let human nature step in the way and get that. Now, as he begins to come down through the passage, he says, from, uh, from those uh, turn away. And then he says, they're this sort. We talked about that this morning. I'm going to give you a few more verses. Are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sin, led away with diverse lust? Heavenly Father, we pray now that you might help us. If you would please consider being with us through the power of the Holy Spirit to help us to understand these matters, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I realize the passage is uh, uh, maybe a little bit offensive to some people because people nowadays in a politically correct environment would say, how dare you call any woman silly? Well, you didn't read the passage correctly. He didn't call all women silly. It's not a women's lib passage. It's not a male chauvinist passage. He said a woman that is misled by these people that are in verses 2 to 7 there, that's the woman, he said, is a silly woman that are led away because they have different or divisive or a multitude of lusts. That's what diverse means, is a multitude of different kinds of lusts. And so I'm going to show you some of those things here tonight. But don't get the impression that he's calling all women stupid. After all, he said in Genesis chapter number 2, it is not good that man should dwell alone. And therefore, it was God that chose to make a woman, not Adam. Adam wasn't running around at the local sock hop, running around at the local club, going out at nighttime trying to pick up some woman, running around in his 442 or his uh, 57 Chevy or whatever it might be and playing the hip hop bebop and getting out in his zoot suit and twisting the, 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 uh, the, the chain there and that kind of a deal. Adam ain't trying to pick up nobody. He's perfectly happy, just him and God. You know what God said about the man? It's not good that he dwells alone. God's the one that said the man needed the woman. God's the one that created the woman to be the help meet. God's the one that said that a man shouldn't be alone. Are you hearing me, fellas? It's not good to be by yourself. You say what? You get yourself in trouble. You get yourself in trouble. This man cave stuff, this be alone by myself stuff, this all the... God made you to be a husband, made you to be a father. And if you're alone, you're to be about the Lord's work. You say, why? Too much hand, too much time on your hands becomes idle. The next thing you know, you're in trouble. Idle hands, they say, are the devil's workshop. What I say is, is at nighttime when the lights go down, that's when you go in the toy box and pull out all the toys that you don't want nobody else to know about. Amen. You're better off with a wife. Well, you say, why? Keep you out of trouble. Amen. As long as she's around, she may keep you from looking at something you shouldn't and going somewhere you shouldn't and saying something you shouldn't, doing things. It's a good balance to you. Amen. You don't need the woman on the inside of you. You need a woman beside of you to help you out. And so in the passage here, what he says to you is, is that the women have to be on guard. You got to watch out. You have to pay attention. He likens them to Janus and Jambres. Those are Old Testament uh, magicians over there in the days of Moses coming out there where they're able to do all kinds of things. He's likening these people to people that do stuff like magicians do. Conjure up spirit, sleight of hand, uh, the hand's quicker than the eye. Watch the birdie, watch the birdie, watch the birdie while they're doing the actual trick over here. One of the things that I was taught in deciphering information, large amounts of information is, is that if you have a lot of things going over here, that's probably not the main attack. That's to draw away your attention so that they can get something on you over here. I can't remember the town or the city, the place up there on the coast that Hitler was convinced that the D-Day invasion was coming in and his generals or nobody could convince him that it was coming down at Normandy. He didn't believe him. He had his panzers up there. He had all the troops that were up there. He had the, the, the majority of the Luftwaffe that was up there with the exception of Chesty Puller, not Chesty Puller, of uh, uh, Pips Puller uh, there and his wingman. He didn't have anybody down there to defend the, the, the beaches at Normandy because he was convinced convinced that where the attack was, was the real deal. They had been so successful, the Allies had, at convincing him that the surprise was going to be another place and that Normandy was just a diversionary tactic, that Hitler got it wrong. You know what he's trying to say to you ladies? Because you have certain lusts, there's certain things in you, certain things in your personality, certain things in your nature that make you easy pickings and if you're not willing to face that, you can be led astray by somebody that does not have your best interest at heart. Now that's what the Bible says. 
So you have to keep your lust under control. Most of you are made when you're insecure. And if you don't want to believe that, then, you know, then okay, fine. But you're insecure and you're inferior when it comes to strength for men. You may have more mental strength than some men, but you don't have more physical strength than some men. You might be more detailed than some men, but you don't have the ability to last as long as a man can last as a whole. There may be exceptions to the rule. A woman wearing, uh, you know, blue jeans or, a, or a, a coveralls and brogans and, you know, has a deep voice and all and too much testosterone. She might be the exception. But generally speaking, according to the Bible, you're the weaker vessel. The Bible doesn't tell you men leading captive silly men. He says women. Now, why is that important? Law first mentioned, the Lord created the woman to be a helpmeet to the man. And the devil comes and he doesn't attack the man. He attacks the woman to get to the man. Which reminds me to tell you, if you're married, you have to be careful because the devil is more apt to come at you than he is to come at him. But he'll come at you to get to him. Amen, preacher. Good preaching. I appreciate you enlightening us tonight. And you seemed a little bit uh, ready to rumble and ready to go. And I'm talking fast so I don't fall asleep. Somebody gave me a Benadryl in between because my nose started running. And them things knocked me on my can. I wouldn't be a good drug addict, man. <laughs> I mean, I think about heroin. I get the nods just thinking about something like that. I, you know, I wouldn't be a good drunk. I'd probably like it. I don't know. Take a drink and go to sleep. And for me, I guess it'd be like one of them little capfuls of uh, NyQuil or whatever blue stuff is. I drink that stuff, man. I feel like I took a shot of liquor or something, man. I'm, whew, whew. I'm thinking, how could somebody, and it burns your stomach. And I'm thinking, why would you want to do that? And then as soon as I do, I mean, I can't even get upstairs. And Andrina's like, hey, honey, I'll... I mean, I am out, man. You talk about a cheap date, man. Here, give me a little thimble full of NyQuil. I'm out. I don't own anything, you know. <laughs> Here, baby, here's the money. Go ahead. Do whatever you want. I don't make no difference to me. You know? <laughs> Did you have a good time? Yeah, what I remember of it. I uh, I, I don't know about that stuff, but they, they gave me a Benadryl. <laughs> and so I told Drina, I said, get me something. My nose started running for some reason, something in here. I, I, don't worry, I'm not sick. I don't have anything like that. Y'all are, I'm going to stay out. Of this. I'll put my mask on for you. But it was just my nose running. And I, that's irritating when you're trying to preach because all you hear, you sound like a bull up here snorting. All you needed me to be doing while I was talking this morning was <laughs> paw the ground, you know, to make you think I was fixing to charge you or come out of the gate. By the way, I rode a bull once. I'm just giving you a little personal story. I did once. There's a friend of mine, his name was Hendrix. He worked at the Atlantic Bank and he had some bulls out there and he said, you used to ride some horses? And I said, yes, sir, I rode some horses. And he said, are you good at it? And I said, I was all right at it. I, I, I did okay. I could stick on them pretty well. I was a little stick man back in those days. I said, I could hang on. He says, you ever rode a bull? I said, no, but I don't figure it's much different. He said, oh, really? I said, okay, well, good. <laughs> This is a full-time professional cowboy, right? And so uh, we go out there and they bring out a bull there. And I mean, the bull is so small, my feet are almost touching the ground when I, when I get on the bull in the shoot thing there. I didn't even change my clothes, put on jeans or nothing. I took off my tie and my coat and stuff and I straddled that bull and they got him strapped down and I'm thinking, this is going to be like riding a little calf or something like that. You know, and he's up there, bah, you know, making these noises and stuff. And they put the tickler on him and he said, are you ready? And I said, I'm ready. The last thing I remember was hearing the hinge on that gate go like that. And the next thing, I don't know what happened. I was eating dirt. I'm all down there. I'm rolling around. And that thing's trying to, I mean, I guess he was thinking I was dead or something. That thing was pushing me on the ground with his head. And they're all running out there and jumping at the thing. I mean, a little old bitty, that thing didn't weigh 300 pounds. And he said, man, that was really good. You lasted a second. <laughs> he said, you want to try it again? And I'm like, You know, when you fall on your diaphragm and that kind of a thing, you, I mean, I, I fell from about the size of that side of that pulpit. You say, well, did you do it again? I said, I told you I rode a bull one time. I learned my lesson. That wasn't even them big bull. That was a little old bitty tiny bull, that kind of a thing. You say, why do you tell that story? Just so that you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm a risk, I'm a risk taker. <laughs> Within reason. I'll never do that again. I look at these guys riding bulls now, I think you're an idiot. Yeah. You, are, you are an absolute idiot. Boy, you talk about putting your pride in check right quick. They're laughing at me and mocking. I said, laugh on, man. I ain't getting back on that thing. I hurt for a week after that. That thing snatched joints out of me I didn't know I had. I didn't need to go to a chiropractor, man. I mean, they had my hand tied down there, and I'm thinking, man, this, I, you know what I was worried about? I was afraid my hand was going to get stuck in the rig, and that I, and my hand was going to be there, and the rest of me was going to be gone somewhere else. They tied it down so tight. You'd be surprised how quick that thing comes loose. 
I mean, within one second, everything from my sacroiliac all the way to the top of my toes, man. I mean, that thing snapped me in line. My hand turned loose. I couldn't have held on if I wanted to. And I'm down in the dirt with that thing pushing me. That old snotty nose down there going, <laughs> rolling me around the ground like that. And Jimmy laughing. He couldn't quit laughing. He had a big old long handlebar mustache hanging off that kind of stuff. And he was spitting skull. I thought, my goodness, man, you made a believer out of me. And the next time we're sitting there together, they're all talking about riding. You say, what'd you say? <laughs> Can you ride? <laughs> nope, I don't know nothing about it. <laughs> Now, ladies, what I'm trying to tell you is, is God gives you a warning in the Bible for a reason. It's not to belittle you, to put you down. It's to make you aware that if you'll pay attention, God can help you in ways that even your husband or your daddy can't help you. It's to pay attention because God, when He made you, He knows there are certain things that are about you that you have to be careful. And one of those things has to do with what's called diverse lust. Are you in the book of Isaiah? Look at Isaiah chapter number 1. Look in verse number 4. Ah, sinful nation, he says, a people laden, that means burdened with, that means overcome with, that means uh, uh, having it laid on you, a big burden, a big bag. Laden, he says, with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should you be stricken anymore? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the heart is faint. You know what he says to you? He said, there's a problem with you, and the problem is you're laden down. That's the word he uses in 2 Timothy. Come to 2 Peter real quick. 2 Peter. He uses the word laden. He said, what are they laden with? Diverse, multiple lust. Diverse lust. They call diversity, meaning that you have uh, multiple choices, like a multiple choice question. You have A, B, C, or D, all the above kind of a thing. Diverse lust. He's accusing women of, women of having certain lusts. Not everybody has the same lusts. So what he says to you is, is if you have that, he's likening it unto the people that are leading you captive are the sort that they are, are like magicians. Slide a hand, tell you what you want to hear, let you see what you want to see instead of what the real truth is. A magician told me one time, and I don't know about all that stuff, some of that stuff I think, especially the Copperfield stuff and all that, I think some of that stuff has to be connected with demons. That jumping, time traveling and doing stuff like that that you can't explain with an explaining machine. Houdini and stuff is into the black arts and the occult and the other guy that competed with Houdini for all their tricks and things like that. I think a lot of that stuff is occultic, spiritual stuff that I don't want anything to do with. But you know what he said? He said it's easy to fool people that want to be fooled. He said, being a magician is really no different than being a con man because all you have to do is, is let the people see what they want to see. That's profound. He said, it's really not magic. It's really just they want to believe that you're doing something. And he said, so sometimes you do the trick right in front of them. If you knew what you were looking for, you'd see the trick. But he said, they don't want to see the trick. They're blinded by it. Well, he likens it to Janus and Jambres. Janus and Jambres could commit and do everything that Moses could do with the exception of create life from dust. That's pretty powerful magic work, wouldn't you say? That's pretty powerful occultic behaviors. You know what he does? He compares these people that creep into houses and lead captive silly women to magicians that have the ability to do certain things that are inexplicable any other way than to utilize demonic spirits to be able to do it. You know what that means? That means, ma'am, you can be open to demonic possession. That means you can be fooled by preachers in the pulpit that sound so nice and they sound so sweet and they look so good and that you like how they talk to you because you feel like, you know what, you're getting the, the, the princess and the frog situation. All right, now watch, if you will, please, in 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter number 3, come all the way down to verse number 17. 2 Peter 3, 17. Ye therefore, beloved, he says, seeing ye know these things before, beware, 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 lest ye also, being a leg with error of the wicked, fall into your own steadfastness. You know what he said? You better watch it. You better pay attention. All right, let's look at diverse lust. Come, if you will, please, to Mark chapter 4. Just a few of these. Mark chapter 4. You ever want to know what Mark is? It's kind of like a, a hair-lipped dog trying to bark. Instead of barking, going bark, bark, he goes mark, mark. That's funny. I'm, I'm sorry. That's politically incorrect. 
I said the dog, not the person. I, I understand that. Mark chapter number 4, this is the, the, uh, the seed being sown and those kind of things. And so you know the passage right here. Now watch what happens. We're talking about lusts, right? Diverse lusts. Are you with me, ladies? All right, now watch what he had. We're having a women's meeting right now. Look, if you will, please, down and all the way down to, oh, make it 19. And the cares and the cares and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lusts of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. You know what he says? The cares of the world. I got to have insurance. I got to have this. I got to have a house. I got to have a car. I got to have more than one pair of shoes. I have, to have th I have to have this and that and the other to make me feel safe. And then come on down there, the deceitfulness of riches. I, if, I'm, if I'm rich, I'm safe. That's deceiving you. The riches that don't make you safe. And the lust of other things. Diverse lust is what he's talking about. Uh, take your Bible and come over to Proverbs chapter number 30. Proverbs 30. Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Psalms, Proverbs. Something like that. There's something in between there. Psalms chapter number 30. And pick it up, if you will, please, in verse number... 20, make it 19, make it 18. <clears throat> there are three things that are too wonderful for me, yea, four, which I know not. The way of an eagle in the air. What he's drawing attention to is, is that you look at the eagle and you can't tell where he's going or where he's been. That's an amazing thing he's saying. You look at the bird, it's a beautiful bird, it's flying, but where did he come from? You can't tell, he doesn't leave a track, he doesn't leave a trace. You can't tell where he came from. Where is he going? You don't know. You have to watch him to see where he's headed. The way of an eagle in the air. The serpent upon a rock. You ever seen a serpent upon a rock? Where did he come from? Where is he going? There's no trace of him. You can't track him. You understand? That's an amazing thing. Everything else usually leads a trace or a track behind him. The way of a ship in the midst of the sea. Where has he come from? Well, he pulled out of the harbor. Yeah, but after the whitewash has gone down and all the, uh, the, the stuff there in the, the, what's the sparkling stuff in there, phosphorus, is that what it is, in there, after all that's laid down, you can't tell a ship came by there. Ask these boys that were in the military and then big old ships get out there, then big old carriers and they bust them waves up and stuff like that. And after one set of waves comes through there, you can't even tell where that ship went to, where it came from. You have no idea of knowing where it came from. He's making a comparison here for you to see. He's fixing to show you something. The way of a man with a maid. Now, I get into that other stuff a little bit later on, but he's making a picture there. You say, what is he doing? He's tricky. The woman doesn't know any better. She's a young woman. And the man's up to something. How do you know? Look at verse number 20. Such is the way of an adulterous woman. You can't tell where she came from. You don't know where she's going. She eateth and wipeth her mouth and saith, I have done no wicked. Oh, my goodness, man. You're all the way out in 2020. You know what you're saying? An adulterous woman is a woman that's married to another a man and messing around with a man that's married. And she's saying, I haven't done anything wicked. Nothing wrong with me. That's a woman. You talk about the depths of a depravity. When you get a woman talking that way, I can see a man talk that way. I didn't do nothing wrong. I mean, you know, it's just animal instinct, preacher. You know, it's just how we are. You know, you know how us are, men, sowing them oats and that kind of... That's a woman. That's an adulterous woman who when she's finished, wipes the slobber off of her mouth and her lipstick and squares it away and said, I didn't do nothing wrong. What's wrong with me shacking up? What's wrong with me messing around with another man's husband, another woman's husband? What's wrong with me having a little fun? I mean, after all, you're deceived, ma'am. You're deceived. That's the depths of depravity. A woman is supposed to be virtuous. She's supposed to be pure. She's supposed to be clean. She's supposed to be upstanding. This woman right here comes in and she goes, I haven't done nothing wrong. You know what he does? He compares that thing to the woman. You can't tell where she's coming from. You can't tell where she's headed. You can't tell what about that, what's going on. First Timothy chapter 6. I don't mean to shock you. Some of you are like, you mean that's in the Bible? Yeah, if you read it every now and then, you might not be looking so shocked after I read it till you're like, that's a, that ain't in the Bible. Some of you got your Bible. You're like, wait a minute. I, what? That's in the Bible? Yeah, an adulterous woman wiping her mouth and saying while she's wiping her mouth, I've done nothing wrong. I ain't done nothing wrong. Committing adultery, that ain't wrong, is it? 
Mighty quiet. I bet you you'd think different about it if it was your wife or your daughter. I bet you'd change your tune then if she's that woman saying, I've been with somebody else. Well, I ain't done nothing wrong. You say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about leading captive silly women who have drawn away because of their own diverse lust. You know what it says in the book of James? No man that is tempted when he is tempted can say, I'm tempted of God. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust. That's what he's talking about. But what he's trying to show you is, is that when a nation gets to the point that the women in that nation are that way, your nation's done. When mama ain't mama no more, grandma ain't grandma no more, your nation is done. God looks at a man and says, well, he's a stinking pig anyway, and I can understand that. But man, when a woman gets to that point right there, you talk about, hey, old Columbia, man, you are in some kind of mess. That's the state of your nation right now. You want me to up the ante for you? He's talking about women in the church. Drawn away of diverse lust. And when sin is conceived, it bringeth forth death. Women, there should be an innocence to them. Not anymore. My goodness, man. Women nowadays will make a man blush. You shouldn't be proud of that. Gone long past smoking cigarettes on the end of a pole. Long past, you've come a long way, baby. Long past, you know, laying up here and making a hamburger commercial and, and, uh, and offering yourself on the order of man's appetite and that kind of stuff. you way past that. But the sad thing is, is that he's talking about women in church. Christians. I ain't done nothing wrong. Why should men have all the fun? What's wrong with that? He didn't say the men had diverse. There's plenty of stuff in there about the men. We ain't talking about them, ma'am. We're talking about you. You know, the shadow of death. Eye shadow. Catch them with your eyes. Wink and a nod. Yeah, you've come a long way, baby. <coughs> First Timothy chapter number 6. Notice what the Bible says in verse number 9. 6, 9. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. Remember the deceitfulness of riches and fall into a snare and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful what? Lust, Lust which drown men in destruction and perdition. It's they that will be rich, but you know what? I'm willing to pay whatever price I got to pay to get whatever it is I want to get. You know what he said? It's not that it's just those that will be rich. It's that when you want to do that, they fall into foolish and hurtful lusts. It's not just wanting money. It's the foolish and hurtful lust that come with it. Diverse lust, multiple lusts. Appeasing your flesh for what you want. Titus chapter number 3. Timothy, Titus. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus. Chapter number 3. Now, I, I, I know it sounds like I'm being hard on you, but I'm trying to give you a warning. You have, to be, you have to pay attention. You're emotional by nature. God made you that way. Stop trying to be anything but that. You're emotional by nature. You may learn to overcome it. You know, maybe you can wind up being a, a SEAL or a special forces person or whatever. But by nature, as a general rule, you are made to be emotional. You're made that way. You lead with your heart, not your head. Men, my aching back. I don't even need to go there. Uh, men, men got a heart like a crusty barnacle on the bottom side of a stinking pier out there in the middle of the ocean. I mean, they're all they're thinking about. Ain't no emotion at all. It's just fulfilling my appetite. Me, 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 me. And don't you tell me it ain't that way. You, I marry her. No, uh -uh, I love her. That's why I married her. No, 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 no. Uh-uh. You getting something out of the deal, big boy. You ain't fooling me. You expect something in return. That's not biblical love. You expect something out of it. But that woman, she's tied up emotionally. You think I'm kidding you? Forget her birthday. Now, on one hand, she don't want you to remember her birthday because she's a day older, but on the other hand, if you forget it, you're going to be out on the couch. <laughs> forget her anniversary. Thank you for your honesty, sister. You other ladies are like, oh, no, I just don't really care about that stuff. You're a liar and your feet stink and you don't love Jesus either. <laughs> 
You think if a man takes out the garbage can, he loves you, and if he doesn't, he's forgotten all about you and ready to put you on the trash heap. Or wash the car. Or remember your favorite perfume or your color or what movie you'd like to have or what you'd love to do on your bucket list before you kick the bucket. You got your mask on, but I can see, I can tell what's going on. <laughs> I missed a great illustration this morning. We were talking about learning to listen and being quiet. Everybody's got a mask on. The Lord's kind of like, yeah, here's an object lesson. I'm trying to shut this up so these two will open up. You can't have these two open with this thing going all the time. But, ma'am, your tendency is to talk it to death. And, sir, your tendency is, is, I'll shut you up. Your tendency is to hit something. That's Cain and Abel. I wish Brother Gentry was here. At least he'd amen me tonight. You guys are looking at me like a blinking frog in a hailstorm. Y'all are like, well, I thought he was kind of out there this morning, but he is way out there tonight. It must have been that bull got to him. Yeah, he, he, he must have hit his head. I'm trying to warn you women. You're emotional. You'll make decisions emotionally that don't make any sense. That's what God says. Because you want to fulfill an emotion. Titus chapter 3, verse number 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. To speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts, that's what we're talking about, and pleasures, living in malice and envy and hateful and hating one another. You know what he just gave you? The diverse lust is to go ahead and, and take it out on your emotions. You hate somebody. You're bitter towards somebody. You're anger to angry towards somebody. You're malicious towards somebody. You know what he's doing? He's warning you. He's cautioning you. That's your lust that's wanting to have its way. In Romans chapter number 12, you don't have to turn there. I'd like for you to come to 2 Peter chapter number 2. In Romans chapter number 12, you know what he says? He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, 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 and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You know what he said? He says, your arms, your hands, your ears, your eyes, your mouth, your teeth, your feet, everything should belong to God. That's reasonable for God to ask for you to do that. You know what your lusts say? It's mine, I'll do with it what I want. I realize men can pout and run to the man cave when they get upset with you and they get mad and get poochy lipped because you didn't fix them their favorite meal or, you know, whatever it may be and that kind of a thing. But man, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. You're going to make somebody pay somewhere. It ain't in the Bible, but it's sure scriptural. You say, give me a tight picture. Jezebel, she kill you for looking at her. She'll kill you to get your property. She'll kill you to be in charge. Who do you think was the real king of Israel, Ahab or Jezebel? Nobody in here would disagree with me. You know who the neck was that turned the head of that boy. And them two preachers come in there and try their best to get that old man's attention and he don't listen and he don't listen and he don't listen and he don't listen. You say, why? Somebody at home, all emotionally worked up, gets mad, goes over to Naboth and Naboth says, I'm not giving it away, it's an inheritance. And she winds up putting a scheme together and writing a bunch of letters and having that guy brought up on fake charges. But she don't stop, ma'am, with just killing Naboth. She has to kill everybody in Naboth's lineage because it would have been passed down to the third and the fourth and the fifth generation so she kills his whole family so she can give him what he wants so she can have her way. You say, what was that? That's anger. Yeah. You don't see it very often, but you see it on occasion. And if you ever want to see the real nature of a woman, you study female serial killers. And female serial killers, buddy, when they get it in their crawl that they're going to kill you, they're going to kill you as soon as look at you or die trying. That's some of the most vicious women you've ever seen in your life. Some of the most vicious murders I've ever seen in my life was a woman killing a man or a queer killing another queer. I mean, you talk about overkill. One of them down there on Hendricks Avenue, down there, a little house on the right-hand side, just before you get into San Marco down there, and you're over there on the right-hand side. That guy killed that guy 70-something times. He stabbed that guy. The guy was long gone dead. I mean, the first time hit him in the aortic vein and took his heart out right there and then just kept just stabbing him all over, just gritted teeth, just stabbed him, just soaked in blood. You say what? Just vicious, just vicious. That's what happens with a woman caught up in emotion. 
angry. You're seeing an uptick in that nowadays. You say, why? It never used to be that a woman would have the backbone to go kill somebody. Else, and nowadays, they just soon kill you as look at you. Ask the boys that are down there working homicide if I'm not telling you the truth. You say, what is that? That Bible is a fulfillment. Of, I mean, the, the stuff going on now is a fulfillment of that passage in Isaiah 3 where he says women and children have the rule over them. Yep. You're living in a day and time right now where women are going to run everything. You say, well, I don't believe that. Well, you don't believe history then because history repeats itself. And what you're fixing to see happen is the rise. Do you know what happens when the Antichrist comes? I hope you know. I'm sure you do. You probably do. You're Bible believers. You know one of the statements made about the Antichrist? He doesn't regard women. Now you can take that two ways. Either number one, he's a homosexual. Or number two, he ain't letting no woman tell him what to do. But you've got an odd thing if you're going to go with the second of the two things because you get over and start reading Revelation and you know what he says? You boys are in Jezebel's bed. And you better get out. Have you read it? It's in the passage. It's in the book of Revelation. Why haven't you read it? You say, what's happening? That's being in the bed from a church standpoint with a woman that's the whore of Revelation. That's Roman Catholicism. Making those unholy unions, secret handshakes, working out deals with Rome on seven hills with purple and gold and a chalice and drinking the blood of the saints likened unto a woman. The Bible doesn't call her prostitute or a woman of the evening, calls her a whore of Babylon. Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots. That's a woman. That's a woman without God. That's what a woman is capable of being if you don't let God run your life. You say, why? Diverse lust. I'm going to be on top, man. I'm going to be in charge, man. I'm going to be the boss, man. I hope I'm making you fellows uncomfortable. Some of you look like you're about to throw up. So I was scared of her before, but now I'm really scared of her. <laughs> 2 Peter chapter number 2. 2 Peter chapter 2, let me hurry. Look at verse 18. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they lure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness. That's a, a desire that's never quenched. Much wantonness. It goes right along with gluttony. Those that were clean escaped from them who live in error, while they promised them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for whom a man is overcome of the same he is brought into bondage. You know what he's like? And in that thing too, come to the book of Jude. Jude. That's the last book, excuse me, before Revelation. What is he trying to do? Give you a picture of what a woman looks like without God? Give you a picture of what the church will look out, look like without being in subjection to God? You say it can't be. Well, what do you think the whore of Babylon is? It's a direct rebellion against God saying, I'm going to be in charge. God ain't going to tell me what to do. A pope. I, I, can't, I can't even get my head around a pope thinking he's the vicar of Christ. What, a, what, what, what insanity for any man to think he is God's representative on earth. But that thing gets so bad, you know what that thing's like a nun too? You say, well, that's called uh, Mystery Babylon, the mother of harlots, right? Am I right? It's in the Bible. Read it. It's in bold letters in your Bible. And there's 13 words that are there. But let me ask you this question. Do you know what he compares the church to? A female. You know what she's supposed to be like? Not a harlot. Not letting just anybody and everybody in to have their way for good times and let the good times roll, baby. She's supposed to be like an unto a chaste virgin. Clean, pure, white, single-minded, white gown she's wearing single-minded, committed to one man, not playing the field, not playing the world, not... I hadn't done nothing wrong. You're already committed. You're already married spiritually to the head of the church, which is Jesus Christ. Amen. You ain't married to the Pope. You're married to Jesus Christ. You know what He expects out of you? Chastity. He likens unto you a good woman, Proverbs 31. 
I buried a good woman just a couple of days ago. Just a few days ago, a woman, 41 years of age, spent her life since she was 12 years of age, committed her life to serving the Lord, had a son and a husband, and all she'd ever done was do what she could do from cooking and cleaning to scrubbing toilets and taking care of campers that came out there and led, and I asked the thing, nobody was bragging about it. She led over 300 kids to the Lord, and they quit counting. Man, what a way to go, sister. 41 years of age. I talked to her in March when I was out there. Preacher, she said, would you do me a favor? If I die before the rapture happens, would you do my funeral? I said, well, Miss Ann, you ain't going nowhere. She goes, well, yeah, but if I do. I thought to myself, man, you're already talking about being ready to go. My wife's 30 years older than you are, and you're talking about going. She must have known something. But you know what she said? She said, well, if the Lord sees fit to take me, I'm ready to go. Amen. What is that? That's a good woman. Amen. Gave up all her hopes and dreams and her talents and all that to do what? Go out in a camp. A, what was it out there, Brother Woodard? 102 or something like that out there? I mean, smoking, stinking hot out there. People gathered around under that gazebo thing and all out there in the trees and the woods and not a stinking breath of air. It wouldn't even move the leaves on a willow tree. And standing out there, and she said, I only want you to do one thing at my funeral. And I said, okay, well, what would that be? She said, preach the gospel. I got a bunch of people that won't be, that'll be there, even in my family, that are lost. She said, would you do that? Well, I did the best that I could and then walked over there with the pallbearers and put her in the ground. They wouldn't even let you go over there to be with her until they got her covered up with dirt. I thought, what a way for an unsung hero to go. 41 years of age. A good woman, loved the Lord, believed the book, served God her whole life, committed herself to serving the Lord at 12, 12 years of age. Some of you are 20 and 30 years older than she is and you still hadn't committed, have you? <clears throat> Not a very good woman according to God. Do you know you can serve the Lord, whether it's in a hospital ward or whether it's serving your husband and your kids? Did you know you can serve the Lord wherever you are, just being the good woman to do what God would have you to do? You don't have to be a Florence Nightingale. Not everybody's called to do that. Can you do what you can? You say, where do you get such stupidity, preacher? I'm preaching on women, so be quiet a minute and let me finish. The Lord's over there, and of all the men that He could draw attention to, from everybody in the Old Testament, Elijah and Elisha and Nehemiah and Jeremiah and all those great old preachers and Moses and all that other kind of stuff, He comes along there with 11 apostles that are pretty good fellows and one's a devil and that kind of thing. You wouldn't expect much out of Him. And of all the people He could draw attention to and all the people He could recognize, including John the Baptist, He recognizes a woman. You know what He says about that woman, ladies? He says, oh, she was a great missionary. She sold out, went to Africa by herself. She went out there and, and she taught for 10 years and didn't get a single convert. And, but now there's 20,000 people here and 20,000 people there. You know, we don't say that about her at all. You know what he says? Only a couple of things about her. He says to her sister one time, she hath chosen the better part. But the epitaph on that woman's crowning, uh, uh, the crowning jewel on that woman's crown, the epitaph on her tombstone is, she hath done what she could. What in the cat hair did she do, Lord? What she could. That ought to speak to every woman in this place. Are you just doing what you can do? Everybody's not as talented. You know, the Lord didn't put it on talent. The Lord didn't say you've got to be a great singer like you heard this morning. You have to be a great uh, pianist or accompanist. You have to be a great teacher, a great preacher. You have to be, you know what he said? Just can you be what you can? Just do what you can. I made a memorial to the woman wherever the gospel is preached. Make sure you mention this woman. Who is she? Her name's Mary. What did she do? What she could. She's just a good wife to her husband. She's just a good help me. She's just taking care of him while he's sick, nursing him, taking care of him, treating him like a little boy sometimes so that he can get some care and get some sugar from mama and, and that kind of a thing. Just doing what she can, doing what she can with the kids, doing what she can with the grandkids, doing what she can at the church, just doing what she can, vacuum a floor, a sweep a floor, just, just what she can do. A kind word every now and then, a card every now and then, a letter every now and then, a phone call or a text message and that kind of a thing. I mean, just for the purpose of being encouragement to people. Is that you, ma'am? I don't know if it is, but I'm preaching on him. You say, why? He's warning you. The temptation is to try to do more than God told you to do. Just do what you can do. 
You'd be surprised. If you learn to do what you can do, you'd be absolutely surprised what God will use you to do. You know what God's looking for? Just to be available. As you say, well, so-and-so doesn't come and so-and-so doesn't do this. You don't know the hell she might be living in at home trying to just take care of her husband and kids and she's doing all she can just to set an example to be in church. You don't know if she's sick or not, mentally or physically. You have no idea. You just look at her and think, well, you know, if I'm doing it, they ought to be doing it. Just do what you can do. Worry, let God do that. God didn't ask the apostles, what do you all think about her? The apostles wrote her off. What you doing in here, lady? Who do you think you are? This is a men's meeting. Get the heck out of here. What blaze you? This is our time with Jesus. <coughs> and that woman don't stop. She keeps walking. She comes down there to the feet of Jesus and she takes that alabaster box and everybody's like, oh boy, here we go. Here comes the cologne bottle. Here comes the perfume. And, and look at this thing. And shatters that thing, boy. Sounds like a cobalt bomb going off. And that perfume changes the entire room in there. And the Lord says to them boys when they try to get in her way, let her alone. She hath done what she could. Will he say that about you, ma'am? I don't know. I, I don't know if he would or not. But sometimes women have a tendency to want the approval of men or they want the recognition or they want the appreciation and all that. There's no better appreciation than for God himself to say about you at the judgment seat, ma'am, she hath done what she could. How would you like men? How would you like to be in the skin of a woman? I'm not talking about because you're feeling that way either. I'm talking about what if you'd have been born a woman? Would you be man enough to be a woman? I wouldn't want to be a woman. Not and do what you have to do as a woman, please have me delivered. I'm just saying, you got a tough part. You fellas are kind of hard on them, aren't you? Sometimes expecting something out of them. That Bible says when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. Maybe the reason she ain't rejoicing is because the righteous ain't ruling. Maybe you're the problem, old man. Maybe you're the problem, Tiller the Hun. Maybe you're the problem, Adolf. Maybe the reason there's turmoil in your household is because you rule your hand like an iron fist like Napoleon. Maybe the problem's not she's not a good woman. She must be a good woman. She's still with you. Amen. While you run around acting like a cotton-picking dog that's got the heebie-jeebies. Sniffing around after everything, running around in heat. You know, just keep a little spice in your life. Flirting where you got no business flirting. Kind of leaving the gate open a little wide, ain't you, boy? That ain't too plain for you, is it? When you got a good woman at home taking care of you, washing your nasty skivvies, taking care of your socks, washing your clothes, cooking your meals, taking care of your kids, watching over the grandkids, and worrying about you, and you out there playing around like you something big, something special, you a hot shot, ain't you, boy? Maybe the reason she's the way she is is because you the way you are. Amen. Right. Amen. Maybe it's time for us to man up. Maybe our wives might not be so quick to be all the stuff the Lord warns them about if we'd be a little more careful about being a little bit more protective of them. And half the women in here wind up in fear all the time because you boys are peeping at stuff you got no business peeping at and that woman's going from a Coke bottle to a mayonnaise jar now and all of a sudden things run a little cold for you and so you boys all of a sudden start kind of comparing her to people that are half your age, don't you, you pervert you? And that woman's in fear and she's nervous and you're trying to get her to keep up with Hollywood. Drool running out of your mouth, tongue about to slap your jaw silly and you sitting there watching stuff and she's sitting over there, faithful woman, getting old, getting creases in her face no matter how much Botox she has. Crow's feet look like crow's been hopping all over her head and all that kind of stuff. Skin beginning to sag, things beginning to go south and all that kind of stuff. And she's thinking there, he's going to get rid of me. He's going to dump me. He's going to get rid of me. I'm going to die of old age. I, something's going to happen to me. I can't go back to work. I don't know what's going to happen. How can I get a job? What happens if he leaves me? What about this and what about that and sitting there petrified and you're supposed to be her help me? You're supposed to be watching out for her? I'm trying to give a warning to the women but you can't do it without also warning the one she's staying with. Dad, why is it always mom's deal to take care of the kids? I got on the mothers this morning. How about the daddies? Why don't daddy step in there instead of making mom the battle axe all the time? You don't like the conflict, do you? 
afraid the kids aren't going to like you? Well, boys, you'll be able to take that much easier than that woman will. That woman can't take that rejection like you can. You're used to it. That woman can't take that rejection from her own kids. You know, Daddy, I don't like you, and Daddy, you're not nice to me, and Daddy, you're not that. Go to your room. See you later. Have a nice day. I'm paying for your groceries. Get out of here. Honey, you know what, what's going to happen if they, I know what will happen if I don't do that. I'll be held by the half acre around here. I'm just trying to help you. I'm just trying to be kind. I'm trying to tell you that that woman's got diverse lusts and one of them is insecurity and she wants to be safe. She wants to be safe. She's putting that on you, boys. Does she feel safe? Your kids feel safe? Last passage in the book of Jude here, if you would please look, if you will, let's just pick it up in 16. I got to hurry. I got four minutes. 16. Somebody said, you say you got all this, this time. You got more time now because you're not having congregational singing. How is it you're still running out of time? Because I have a lot to say. I actually study a little bit, and I got to get it out so I can make room for more. <laughs> Otherwise, it, get cr it gets crowded in there, and then you wouldn't even know. It'd sound like word salad up here. What's he doing? I'm talking about five other messages he's got stored up there somewhere. I got to get it out now, and that way it'll be better for you on Wednesday night. Verse 16, these are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lust. That's what we're talking about. I got to pause for a second. There's a note here in my Bible that reminds me to say this. If you're murmuring and complaining, it seems that the instigator or the root of that is lust. You want something you don't have and that you hadn't gotten. Walking after their own lust and their mouth speaketh great swelling words, having men's persons in admonition, uh, admiration because of advantage. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before the apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, how that they told you that there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lust. These be they who separate themselves sensual, having not the spirit. You know what he says to you there? He says to you, ladies and gentlemen, those of you that are gathered here today, he said, ladies, you got to watch it. He said, because the sort that they are are going to suck you in based on what you like. They're smart enough to do it. Now, look, I'm not a computer whiz at all. I know a smidgen about it, and I've been taught by some individuals that have taught me how to work my way around it. And because of school, I have to learn how to do certain things uh, with that deal. But here's what I know. I know that they're smart enough in marketing that if I go in there to Amazon.com and I look up shotgun shells, I'm going to get everything that goes with anything to do with a shotgun shell is going to be coming in my inbox on a regular basis or everything I go to look at. They're going to have an ad that pops up over there and... Don't you need a camouflage sweatshirt? And don't you need a hat that goes with that thing? And don't you need a loader? And don't you need gunpowder? And don't you need this? And don't you need that? And all that stuff. You say, why is that? The devil's the same way. He sees what you lust after. And then he says, well, don't you think you need this? And don't you think you need this? And don't you think you need this? And don't you think you need that? You know what he says? He says they're led captive. They started a thing years ago. It's called the Home Shopping Network. Don't raise your hand if you know what that is. You got a credit card, you qualify. And what they do is they run stuff out there and then they give you so much time and the clock's ticking down on the corner. They got you on the clock now and if you don't hurry up and get it, somebody else is going to get it and we only have a certain amount of these things and if you don't hurry up and buy it, somebody's going to buy it out from under you. This is the greatest thing in all and we normally have this thing for $49.95 but for you today, it's $49.95. You get a special deal. I, I mean, it was $49.95 but it's now $49.95 and only if you hurry and only if you get it in the next few minutes and if you get it, you get a free this and you get a free that. And we can set that up for you right away. Just call and tell them you want them and hurry. And the clock's kicking down. Oh, it's almost gone. They almost have. We only got three more. Quick, dial that number. And then you dial that number. And the next thing you know, you got stuff piling up in your garage. You don't even need, but it was on sale. I got a good deal. I don't need it. But it was on sale. But you can't sell it for what you bought it for. Even if you bought it on sale. You got every gadget there is to get. You say, why? I had to have it. I, I just knew that one day I, I was going to have some people over and I was going to make certain hors d'oeuvres and I, I was going to have to, and I needed that egg plate that displayed the eggs. You, you don't even make eggs like that. You know how to scramble them and boil them. 
You don't cut them up, mash them up with pickles and mayonnaise, mustard and paprika and dump them out there. It's like, here's your eggs. You want it boiled or scrambled? <laughs> Much less a plate to devour them on. In my house, they ain't going to last long enough on the plate to even be able to see the plate. And can I ask you a question? Why would you buy the pretty plate? You covered it up with eggs anyway. You can't see the plate. You pick it up and look, oh, ain't that plate pretty? Y'all look at that. Dump all the eggs on the floor. <laughs> and now all you got to do is you got to wash it after you done put eggs all over the thing. And you're thinking, well, that sure is pretty. I saw it when it came out. The eggs went on it. I hadn't seen it until it's time to wash it and then put it back up. But you got to have it. You say, well, it's a display for your eggs. <laughs> and, and nobody makes eggs like you make eggs. You make eggs like grandma made eggs. You got to have that plate. That's an egg plate. You've used it once in your marriage for one special occasion, but it's there just in case. Maybe, possibly, it might come out. A man looks at that thing and says, Give me styrofoam or give me paper because I don't have to wash that. I can burn it or throw it in the trash. But now you're making me eat off of something. And now next thing you know, you're going to have to have a special fork to go with that plate. You can't reach in there and get it with your fingers because you're sophisticated now. You got a plate. You got an egg plate. And so now that plate comes out and all of a sudden, get your hands off the plate. We don't eat like we ain't heathens around here. You got to have one of them little funny pre frong uh, uh, things that looks like Captain Nemo uses. And you can stab it, but you can't eat off of that fork. That's to stab it and to put it on there. But it's got them little prongs on the end of it, so you got to shake that egg off of there. And now that egg that looks so pretty looks like it's been run over or stepped on. You know I'm telling the truth. And now you got it, but you done put the fork back up there. Somebody's like, did you eat off that fork? Mm -mm. No, that's the serving fork. Okay. Don't you reach for that with your fingers. And so now you got to wash the plate and the fork. And the salad shooter to make the stuff go in the egg. A fork and mashing up the egg yeller with a mayonnaise don't work no more. You got to put all that in a contraption and spin it down and then shoot it with a little thing on the end of it there to make sure it's squiggly when it comes out. It can't just be take the fork, put it in the egg. Oh no, 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 no. We got to make it squiggly. And more is left in the salad shooter than goes in the egg. You taking your finger and running around, I can't get the egg, but I can get that, and you know, that kind of thing. Now you got a whole pile of dishes to wash for a plate that you didn't need in the first place. But it looks good in the china cabinet where it's been for 10 years. Grandma, what's that? That's the egg plate. I got that egg plate watching that home shopping network had to have it. And all the utensils came free. Oh, no, they didn't. Somebody paid the price. You got to wash all that stuff and keep all that stuff and dust all that stuff and care for that stuff just in case you ever want to use it after the first time you used it. Here's the illustration. The devil knows exactly what to keep hitting your ad box with. And he just keeps on sending it and keeps on sending it until one day you say, you know what? I'd be better off if I had it. Of this sort of they which creep into houses and lead captive, gullible, silly, easily influenced women. Let's stand together and be dismissed. If you got an egg plate, that's your business. <laughs> Don't you go home and tell your wife, preacher said, throw away the egg plate. <laughs> you fight your own battles. I hope the next meal you have, you have to get your egg plate out.